Well, as you can see, my text is going to be John chapter 9. Now, I'll be concentrating on those three verses there, 39 through 41, but we're actually going to cover most of this chapter, uh, not verse by verse, because we wouldn't have time to do that, but we will, we will be talking about a good portion of it here. Let me start out this way. A sight for sore eyes is an expression describing an expected yet a welcomed experience. For instance, an oasis in the desert is a sight for sore eyes for somebody who's getting pretty thirsty. Uh, a son's face at the door is a sight for sore eyes for a mother who's looking for a son to come home from the war. An A in algebra is a sight for sore eyes to a parent whose child has been struggling in math. I mean, these, and we could just go on and on about a sight for sore eyes, there's so many. But I took a little uh, diversion from that and, and entitled this message, A Sight for Blind Eyes, because as Randy was praying, see, that's what God does for his people in regeneration. He takes those that are blind, dead, literally, dead and blind, spiritually, and he gives us eyes to see, to see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So that's what this whole chapter is about. It's about a, a Christ's encounter with a man who's born blind. Look at verse 1 of chapter 9 there. It says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from birth. Now this Jewish man had heard of the temple. He probably sat in it. He probably sat outside it begging for alms, but he had never seen the majesty. That, that temple was a majestic sight, no doubt. He'd never seen that or the splendor of that temple. And he had heard of Jesus of Nazareth. He'd no doubt come in close proximity to him. In fact, Christ just passed him by on the road. But he had never beheld the face of Christ. So when Jesus healed this man of his blindness... Jesus was no doubt to him a sight for sore eyes, literally a sight for blind eyes, previously blind eyes. Now, Christ's encounter with this man here on the road is no accident. You know there are no accidents with God. There's nothing in this world that he hadn't preordained, no matter how small or how large. So there are no, there are no, it wasn't an accident. There was a reason this man was born blind, and... Uh, the disciples wanted to hear about that reason. Uh, they wondered, did his parents sin or did this man sin that he should be born blind? And look at John 9 and verse 3. Jesus answered, neither has this man sinned nor his parents. But here's the reason, that the works of God should be made manifest in him. In other words, I'm about to work a miracle here, a twofold miracle. I'm going to deliver him from physical blindness and spiritual blindness. That's why he was born blind. Also, this Christ's encounter with this man, not only was there a reason for it, but it had results, and the first of which, of course, was physical sight. Christ anointed his eyes with clay. He sent him to wash in the pool of Siloam, and verse 7 says, he came back seeing he hadn't seen before, but he saw for the first time. But there's another result, a greater result, of this man's encounter with Christ. Uh, uh, I'm going to have to fill in a lot of blanks here because we don't have time to read through all these verses. But after this man came back seeing, Christ had healed him on the Sabbath day, which the Pharisees said, wait a minute now. He's not supposed to be doing work on the Sabbath day. So they came to this man and they said, who healed you? And how did he do it? And, of course, the man told them, and they didn't believe him. And they went to his parents, and they said, look, was this man born blind or not? And his parents, they kind of fudged a little bit, not on this part, but on the next. They said, well, we know he's our son, and we know he was born blind, but now how he was healed, we don't exactly know that. He's of age. Why don't you just go ask him? So... He did. These Pharisees asked this man, and this man gave a tremendous account. He said, this man, he, he came to me, he put mud on my eyes, and I went to the pool of Siloam and washed in it and came back seeing. And they said, 
Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And why they said that was because he did a work on the Sabbath day, which they didn't think he should have done. Well, the end result was uh, when they continued to question him, he said in verse, I don't even have the verse listed here, but the man whose eyes were open said, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. In other words, now, He's risking a lot right here because they already told him if any man claims that Jesus is the Messiah, they're going to be cast out of the temple. So he's risking a whole lot right here to tell them, look, I know this man is from God. I know what he did. I, I know I witnessed the miracle, and I know who he is. Now, look, let's look on and see what happened after they cast him out of the temple. That's where we want to pick up the discourse here in John 9 and verse 35. Now Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? And the man answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? That's a good question for people who are hearing the gospel for the first time especially to ask. Who is this Christ that you're talking about that I might believe on him? Verse 37 said, And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And the man said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Now, Christ was a sight for blind eyes to this man when he gave him physical sight, but he was more so spiritually when he enabled to see him, to know him, to believe him to be the Son of God, and to worship him as the Messiah sent from God. Now, this blind man, this man blind from birth, he's a type. He's a type of those that God has chosen unto salvation. God chose a people in Christ before the world began unto salvation. And they, these people that God has chosen along with all others, are born into this world spiritually blind. We're blind from birth. Those chosen unto salvation are made to see, and all others are exposed as those who might think they see, but are revealed to be blind. That's what Christ summarizes in our text here. When we look at John 9 and verse 39, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into the world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Now we're going to consider two truths from this context. First of all will be the reason for Christ's coming. He said he came for judgment. And then we'll see the results of his coming. And that'll be twofold. That those who don't see might see, and that those who see might be made blind. So the first reason, the first truth is the reason for Christ's coming. He said, for judgment, I am coming to this world. Now Christ came for judgment. In other places, it's said of Christ that he did not come to judge. Look, look at John 12 and verse 4. He said, if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The scriptures make it clear that Christ's first coming was not to condemn. John 3.17, a very familiar verse to us, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So the scriptures are clear on both points. Christ did not come to judge, he came to save, but also that he did come for judgment. Now that might seem like a contradiction to you, and that's why when we're interpreting the scriptures, the context in which we find a word is vitally important. We have to stay with the context. Who's doing the talking? Who's he talking to? What's he talking about? What's the subject? Christ's first appearance in this world was not to judge. In other words, it wasn't to punish or condemn sinners. His first visit, his incarnation, was not punitive in nature. But his first coming was for judgment. He came for the judgment of his people. You see, he was given a people. They were chosen in him before the world began. And he came to bear their judgment. He came to pay the price of their redemption. He came to work out a righteousness in their place. Look at Matthew 20 and verse 28. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, 
but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And he was delivered up to the cross because of the offenses of those he was given. Look at Romans 4 and verse 25 as Brother Jim preached on Romans 4 this morning in, in the 10 o'clock hour. And that whole chapter is about the justification of, of Abraham based on the imputed righteousness of Christ. And so he, he ends the chapter this way, that those who, be, who believe on that same God Abraham believed on have the same righteousness imputed to them. Who was delivered, Christ, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again because of our justification. Christ came to answer all the charges against those that his father had given him. God charged him with their sins. That familiar passage in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin. He charged the sins of his elect to Christ <clears throat> that we, those he represented, might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see, that's that double exchange. Our sins were charged to Christ. His righteousness was charged to us. Christ came for the judgment of his people. He was judged by his Father for them. He bore their sins and put them away. He answered all the charges of those he was given. He established the one righteousness by which God declares those sinners forever, unchangeably righteous in his sight. No sinner Christ died for is facing any charges, any punishment from God's justice. Christ, their surety and substitute, has answered their charges and paid their debt of punishment in full. Christ's first coming was not to judge. It was not to punish or condemn sinners. His first coming was to save sinners. Christ's first coming was not to render a judgment against, but to bear the judgment of those sinners he was given. Now that's one sense in which Christ came for judgment. But there's another sense in which Christ's first coming was for judgment, and that's the sense we'll find in John 9 here. Christ's first coming was also to separate sinners. That's the judgment he speaks of in John 9. Another meaning of the word judgment is to separate. Now that's a different kind of judgment. This judgment is not punitive in nature. This judgment is to distinguish between believers, true believers, and non-believers. This judgment is to reveal in this world who's saved and who's lost. Look at John 9 and verse 5 with me. As long as I'm in the world, Christ said, I am the light of the world. Light has a predictable influence on darkness. It overcomes it. It drives it away. It exposes and reveals what that darkness was previously hiding. Christ is the light that comes to sinners in the preaching of the true gospel. And when he comes, he distinguish, distinguishes between those who are of the light and those who are of darkness. When he, ki when he comes to a sinner in the gospel, he finds all either standing, in, either standing in condemnation or standing in justification. Now that's true of all of us without exception. No exceptions and no exclusions. Christ's coming in the gospel doesn't change a sinner's standing now. It just reveals that standing to be one or the other, condemned or justified. Now, that's the reason for Christ's coming when it says he came for judgment. In this context, it means separating the saved from the lost. It's about distinguishing the justified from the condemned. Now, how is that accomplished? Well, we'll find that answer in our second point here. The first one was the reason for Christ's coming, and here's the second truth we have is the results of Christ's coming. That was the first one, but here's the second. The results of Christ's coming, look at John 9, 39 again, and Jesus said, For judgment I am coming to this world, that they which see not might see. Just like Christ came to this man physically, this man who was born blind, he comes to those who are born spiritually blind. That uh, reading that I had Brother Randy read over there in Isaiah 42, verse 16 says, And I will bring the blind by a way 
that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. When Christ comes to a sinner in the gospel, he only comes to blind sinners, spiritually blind sinners. Why? It has to be because that's the state of all of us by nature. It doesn't matter that we're chosen of God. It doesn't matter that we're justified from eternity the way Brother Jim taught us there from Romans 4 this morning. It doesn't matter that we've been redeemed. We're still spiritually blind until Christ comes to us in the gospel, until the Spirit comes to us in the power of the gospel and delivers us from that blindness. Look at John 12 and verse 46. Christ said, I am come a light into the world, that whosoever believeth on me shall not abide in darkness. That's where we are, but his coming is to deliver us from that darkness. He comes to deliver us from the not only the darkness, but from Satan. Look at Acts 26 and verse 18. Now, he, this is another recounting of Paul the Apostle's conversion experience on the road to Damascus, and Christ is telling him what he's going to be about. He says, you're going to go to the Gentiles to open their eyes and to turn them from the darkness to the light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sin and inheritance among them which are sanctified by that faith which is in me. Christ came for judgment. He came for separation. In our context, 9 verse 39, John 9 39, the first result of Christ's separation is that those who see not might see. The scriptures are clear that all are born spiritually blind. All who are now in the light were once in darkness. All who now see are those who previously saw not. The question is, the question is what is now seen that was not seen before? If we were in blindness, if we miss something, what did we miss? What didn't we see? Now, by nature, we see a lot. The natural man can see a lot of things, a lot of things about Christ. We can see that he's a Savior. We can see that he died. We can see that he died on the cross. We can see that he died in Bethlehem. We can see that he was born of a, of a virgin. We can see a lot of things. We can see his resurrection. We can see that salvation is somehow connected to the one the Scriptures say is the Lord Jesus Christ. What none of us by nature can see is what is vitally necessary for God to be glorified in salvation. What does that word mean, glorified? To be honored, to be revealed, to be the just God and Savior he is. The just God and Savior he describes himself to be in Isaiah 45 when he said, look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I'm God and there's none else. And this distinguishes it, a just God and a Savior. We can't see that redemptive glory of God by nature. None of us sees how God can remain just and yet so show mercy to sinners like us who deserve nothing but his eternal wrath. What none of us sees is what makes the gospel the power of God and salvation because we don't see the righteousness of God which the gospel always reveals. Now, I'm talking to sinners that haven't heard the gospel or haven't been brought by the power of the Spirit to submit to Christ's righteousness as their only ground of salvation. Romans 1, 16 and 17, and we, we look at these verses often, but we do it because we need to. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, that gospel, is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for therein, in that gospel message, every time it's preached, every time God sends a gospel preacher, this is always revealed, the righteousness of God. From faith, from that body of truth that declares it, and into that God-given faith that receives it, lays hold of it, and rests in it for all of salvation. It is, as it is written, the just, the justified, shall live by faith. 
Now, like I said, that gospel alone reveals the righteousness of God. And, that's, and it's what makes that gospel the power of God and the salvation. In the gospel, what is heretofore unknown in a sinner is revealed to every justified sinner. The justified must see, and they will see. They'll see how God can be just and declare a sinner like them righteous in his sight. Until a sinner sees this, he is one among many who sees not. God's chosen people are born, not born, seeing. But God's chosen people will see. They'll see the mystery of godliness. They'll see God manifest in the flesh. They'll see how Jesus Christ enabled the Father to be both, a ju both just and justifier. They'll see our holy and righteous God save sinners by Christ's finished work, his imputed righteousness alone. They'll see that God must be just. He must do what's right when he shows mercy and saves those sinners for whom Christ died. <clears throat> the justified will see this because Christ came into the world for judgment. He came to distinguish his people. He came to separate his people from the unbelieving world. His people in every generation will embrace the gospel. They'll look to a just God and Savior. They'll look to Christ and Christ alone who enables God to be that just God and Savior. Their walk in the gospel will distinguish them and, the evident, and evidence their separation. Look with me at Ephesians 5 and verse 8. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. And then on to 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. He says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar or purchased people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but you are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The encouragement of the apostles here in these verses is for those who've been delivered, those who now see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Those who now have been delivered, walk like you've been delivered. That's what he's encouraging here. Walk like those given light. Walk like those delivered from darkness. Walk like those who seeing not now see. It's good to walk like those. It, it is to walk like those once spiritually blind, but who've been given eyes to behold the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And how do you do that? How do you do what these two apostles command us to do? How do you walk as children of light? How do you show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness unto his marvelous white? Well, you walk in the gospel. You walk in this gospel message. You go with his gospel priest. You preach this message. You promote this message. You defend this message that declares the righteousness of God. And you do so because you see what before you did not see. You do so because the true gospel has changed your thinking about how God saves sinners. Christ came for judgment, and the first result of that judgment is that they which see not might see. My last point is the second result of that judgment. Look back at John 9 and verse 39 again now. And Jesus said, For judgment I'm coming to this world that they which see not might see, and here it is, and that they which see might be made blind. Christ came for judgment. He came to distinguish between the saved and the lost. To those whom God enlightens is the mystery of godliness made known. To those whom God enlightens is the mystery of the righteousness of God, both revealed and embraced, submitted to. All others are made blind. The Greek for made blind is a word meaning to expose. Some which see not are made to see. The rest are exposed 
as those who think they see, but really are exposed as those who see not. When a sinner is brought to the gospel, let me back up for just a second. <clears throat> These are they of which Christ spoke in John 5, 40. Those which are exposed to be judicially blind, spiritually blind. He said, you search the scriptures. In them you think you have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. But then the last part of that verse 40 says, and you will not come to me that you might have life. I'm here. I'm standing before you. I'm preaching the gospel. The scriptures you study and say you understand and believe and love, they're testifying to me, Christ said, but you won't come to me. When a sinner is brought to the gospel, the true Christ is declared, not a counterfeit. The true Christ, the righteousness of God is revealed. The redemptive glory of God, his honor in showing mercy to ungodly sinners is made known. And it's that gospel which will judge sinners in that last day. Look at John 12 and verse 47. If any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejects me and receive not my words has one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. And then listen to John 3 and verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, on the Christ of this word, on the true Christ of the scriptures. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Light, the gospel, the glory of God in salvation has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The gospel is the light here. And it's what reveals the justification of those who believe it. Those who hear the Christ it preaches and come to him, submit to him, see his righteousness as the only ground of a sinner's salvation. But it also exposes condemnation. It exposes the condemnation of those who reject it. Those who refuse the God it shows, the Savior it reveals, and the righteousness it makes known. <clears throat> Let me give you a little illustration here. He's talking about those who think they see, but don't see. And the gospel, it... It reveals one and exposes the other. The eagle and the hawk are daytime predators. The light of day, that's a blessing to them. It gives them extraordinary vision to seek out their prey. But they're not good at night. They, they stay on their roost at night. They hunt in the daytime. But that same light that gives them extra vision in the daytime, that same light is shunned by the owl and the bat. You see, they're nighttime predators. They have night vision. They can see better at night. In a similar way, the light of the gospel is welcomed and embraced by some, but certainly not by all. It's shunned and rejected by others. Look at 2 Corinthians 2, verses 14 through 16. Paul writes, Now thanks be to God, which always causes us He's talking about us who preach the true gospel now. Causes us to triumph and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ. In them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are a savor of death unto death. And to the other a savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? The gospel does not justify us, nor does it condemn us. It, do, it does confront those who hear these things that have never been heard before, that have never been considered before. Also, the gospel does give evidence of the standing of those who hear it. To those who embrace it, it's the savor of life unto life. To those who reject it, it's the savor of death unto death. Now, look at our last two verses here in the text, John 9 and verse 40. 
He says, and some of the Pharisees, which are listening to this discourse, this is a pretty long discourse that Christ had here in John 9, but some of the Pharisees, which were with him, heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Are you saying that we, the pillars of the Jewish faith, that we're blind also? Jesus said unto them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, We see, therefore your sin remains. If you were blind, in other words, if you'd admit to your blindness, your blindness, not, not being able to see who I am based on the scriptures and the works that identified him to be the true Savior. If you'd admit to your blindness, you'd have no sin. See, there's no sin in being blind. We're all born spiritually blind. And we're all blind for a reason, in order that the works of God should be manifest. The sin that remains here is not admitting to our blindness. See, going through life and never seeing that by nature, we didn't know the Christ of this word. We didn't know the Savior of this gospel. We didn't know of his salvation. We didn't know the glory of God in salvation. The sin that remains is not coming to, not embracing the gospel, the light that exposes and ends spiritual blindness in every one the Father chose and gave to Christ before the world began. The sinner who rejects the gospel but thinks he's saved on any other basis but Christ's righteousness imputed is the one who is made, in other words, revealed to be blind. That's our point here. Christ came that those who see might be made blind. Their blindness is exposed by the gospel. The evil of their thinking, see, is exposed by the gospel message. It's exposed by the Savior they reject. Christ came for judgment. He came, first of all, to bear the judgment of his chosen people. But he also came to separate and distinguish those chosen people from the world. Come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. They're born not seeing, but they're given spiritual sight. They embrace the gospel. They embrace its God. They embrace its Savior. They embrace the righteousness revealed therein. And when they do that, that righteousness, that Savior, that God reveals them to be true believers, true children of God. But the judicial blindness of all others is exposed by their rejection of that same gospel, that same Savior, that same righteousness. Let me wrap it up here. Do you see? Has God, under the light of the gospel, enabled you to see what you never saw before? Has he enabled you to see God honored as a just God and Savior based on Christ's imputed righteousness alone? Has he enabled you to repent of everything else that you ever thought recommended you to God but that righteousness and that righteousness exclusively? So do you see or do you seeing see not? See, we're in one camp or the other. There's only two camps to be in here. The glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is truly a sight for previously blind eyes. My prayer is that God will enable us all, all that hear this message, to have that sight, to see that glory, and to see it more clearly as we hear his message proclaimed. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding.